At the turn of the 1930s, Paris, like every major metropolis of the industrial West, was still relishing the wealth of the past decade. Despite the great stock exchange crash of the preceding year, the increasing number of cars in its streets and the constant flow of jazz music from its bars belied the dark days of economic depression that lay ahead. Indeed, the Roaring Twenties, as they were later called, had been particularly good to France. Having successfully imported Henry Ford's factory line economy from America, the country had witnessed an unprecedented industrial boom, which, in turn, had transformed the state into a generous patron of the arts and sciences. One of the greatest beneficiaries of the state's generosity was French archaeology. Throughout the 1920s, the increase in public money had allowed archaeologists such as Jean Gall and Joseph Vaquin to lead expeditions to northwest India and Afghanistan and uncover sites from the time of Alexander the Great's march to the Indian subcontinent. When they returned home with sculptures that were neither fully European nor fully Indian in form, they exhibited them in the Musée Guimet, which became a hub of activity for amateurs of Greco-Buddhist art. Among the keen followers of these new, fascinating exhibits was one of France's most promising young authors, André Malraux. He had been visiting the Musée Guimet since he was a child, and the displays of its Asiatic art section had left him fascinated each time. Indeed, for Malraux, Asia seemed an almost familiar world. By his mid-twenties, he had already gained notoriety for his excursions to Indochina. The first, in 1923, when he was thrown in jail for smuggling archaeological artefacts out of the region. And then, in 1925, for editing an anti-colonial newspaper that the government was quick to censor. Upon his return to France, Malraux became increasingly interested in the new exhibitions on Greco-Buddhist art. Little did he realize that this fascination was about to change the course of his life. Il y a cette uh, uh, permanence uh, des études bouddhistes en France uh, au début du XXe siècle. Uh, il y a uh, les recherches archéologiques que l'école française d'Extrême-Orient mène en Indochine, et il y a depuis 1922 les recherches que la délégation archéologique française mène en Afghanistan. Tout cela forme un foyer à Paris avec des expositions, avec des publications, avec des conférences, et Malraux est très pris, lui et sa femme sont très pris, et, euh, le milieu de Malraux est très, est très intéressé euh, à ses études, à ses, à ses découvertes des civilisations orientales. Donc Malraux va au musée Guimet, Malraux est frappé euh, par euh, une exposition euh, que Aquin avait faite déjà, où euh, il, mettait, il mettait côte à côte euh, des petites têtes, euh, en stuc réco-bouddhique. Il les mettait en comparaison avec des photographies venant de nos cathédrales du Moyen-Âge, cathédrales romanes, cathédrales gothiques. Et euh, cette exposition qui a eu lieu à Guimet, je crois en 1929, a frappé, bien entendu, euh, les grands savants amis euh, de Joseph Aquin. Euh, je parle de euh, Alfred Fouché ou je parle de René Grousset, mais elle a également frappé les jeunes visiteurs et André Malraux a été surpris de ce rapprochement entre l'art du Gandhara, 2e au 5e siècle après Jésus-Christ, et l'art roman, l'art gothique, donc 12e au 15e siècle. By coincidence, the exhibition had also caught the attention of his publisher, Gaston Gallimard, who saw an opportunity to cash in on the public's craze for exotic objects of art. He asked Malraux, who was now working as his editor, to go to northwest India and bring back Greco-Buddhist sculptures. Despite his past record of smuggling, Malraux jumped on the offer. In the early 30s, uh, Malraux went to uh, northern parts of India and other places, and he went there with a the double purpose. First, to educate himself artistically, but the main purpose in those days was to make money. Uh, ethical considerations didn't come uh, into his mind, uh, probably because in those days the idea that uh, a statue belonged to the country where it existed didn't matter. You know, the Elgin marbles were in the British Museum, and the museums of Europe are full of things that have been stolen. What is more surprising, and which wasn't really very really well known, was his formidable, powerful, intelligent editor, 
Gaston Gallimard played along with that, and they created a little uh, company that made uh, quite uh, a bit of money. This, of course, today would be impossible and would not be accepted. In those days, it was accepted as uh, you know the necessities of a young man trying to make uh, his way into life. But Malraux had a personal reason for accepting Gallimard's offer. His father, who longed to visit Afghanistan, had recently committed suicide, holding in his dying hands a book on the Buddhist concept of the afterlife. So when Malraux set sail for India with his wife Clara in August of 1930, he was, in part, undertaking a pilgrimage in his dead father's name. Less than a month after their departure, the two had reached Peshawar. Malraux's sense of excitement was palpable. In the restlessness of the city's markets, where bearded men, veiled women and bullet carts all mingled with a purpose known only to them, he felt that for the first time in his life he was closely approaching the ancient Orient, what he would later call the other pole of our life. Unlike his excursions to Indochina, this time Malro remained completely oblivious to the British colonial regime and its politics. He was here for the sole purpose of tracing the paths caravans had been following for thousands of years through this harsh and rugged terrain to Gandhar, the land where Alexander the Great had produced a unique encounter between Greek and Buddhist art forms. And when he finally reached Greco-Buddhist sites such as Bamiyan, Mauro was struck with astonishment. Larger-than-life figures of the Buddha were adorned with sculptures of Greek gods in a harmonious celebration of the divine. While in the Europe of invasions and in Byzantium, classical canons had to encounter the barbarians and Christ, in the Macedonian kingdoms of India, they had to encounter the Buddha. Kneeling figures, folded hands, and all embracing kindness, a vivid picture of life. Buddhism refused the world, but here we see the only moment in Asian art when it accepts life. As soon as Malraux returned to France, he set up with Gallimard a private limited company, the Galerie de la Nouvelle Revue Française, with the aim of exhibiting and selling the 90 stone pieces he had brought back with him. But his claim that he had discovered the statues in northern Afghanistan, a claim deliberately made to entice buyers, angered specialists, who questioned both their discovery and their provenance. Il soutient toujours uh, cette uh, provenance uh, du nord de l'Afghanistan. Or, tout de suite, uh, les spécialistes protestent uh, ce qu'ils voient. Euh, ce que Malraux présente, euh, ce qui est présenté par la NRF euh, euh, et par Gaston Gallimard, sont des têtes euh, qui sont tout à fait proches euh, des têtes découvertes à Taxila euh, ou découvertes euh, à Jolian. Euh, et euh, par conséquent, les spécialistes crient immédiatement à la fronte. Euh, Malraux euh, ne se départira pas euh, de son attribution. Euh, C'est Clara Malraux, dans une de ses publications bien tardives, euh, vers 1970, euh, qui raconte comment ces têtes ont été achetées euh, dans une petite maison de Rawalpindi, donc effectivement à 30 km de Taxila, à 30 km de Jolian, 40 km. Et euh, dans cette maison, euh, Clara dit bien qu'on sort des têtes, on les leur montre. Et ils les regardent et ils se les passent l'un à l'autre. Et ils sont à nouveau étonnés de ce rapprochement que l'on peut faire avec euh, des sculptures gothiques. Euh, et ils baptisent tout de suite celle-ci, une tête femme, la belle ferronnière. Celle-là, oh, ça, c'est Saint-Louis, une statue, euh, une tête euh, que Malraux gardera précieusement. Celle-là, c'est Alexandre le Grand. Ça, c'est un Duguay-Clin, n'est-ce pas Ça se fait tout de suite, des têtes passent de main en main. Et voilà comment euh, se reconstruit à Rawalpindi, en 1930, ce euh, gothico-bouddhique dont Malraux parlera dans ses catalogues de vente en 1930 et 1931. To make matters worse, Malraux's unusual decision to dissect a gunter and head and juxtapose the two profiles in a curious contemplation of each other further enraged archaeologists. But the controversy soon died down as the exhibition was open to the public, leaving Paris no choice but to marvel at this fantastic synthesis 
of ancient Indian and Greek art. As in modern Western art, matter here is conquered beforehand. Perhaps only once in these oases along the great caravan routes where doctrines confronted each other in the manner of the temptation of Saint Anthony were men able to express a succession of feelings because they had attained total mastery over their tools. Gandhara art acted like a catalyst for the existing art forms. While Buddhism gave to Hinduism a universality it never aimed for, Gandhara art gave birth to a sculpture that India had not envisioned. Here, as in the sculptures of Pan, the same feeling is expressed of compassion for man, conceived as a living being and not as a creature of suffering. Indeed, beyond the aesthetic wonder that was Gandhara art, Mauro became mesmerized by the figure of Buddha himself and of his message on the illusion that is the human condition, on the illusion that is death itself. It was a message that was to haunt Malro and draw him back to India over and over again. By 1958, Malro, in addition to being a famous writer and a resistance veteran, had also become a minister in General de Gaulle's cabinet. These were trying times for the general, who was keen that France not become a mere pawn in the real politic of the Cold War. At public meetings such as these, with Malro by his side, de Gaulle attempted to rally the public to the independent course he was charting for France. Si l'on doit espérer qu'elles ne deviendront pas des ennemis, sont automatiquement des rivales. Dans cette situation, la placer là où nous le sommes, nous, la France, il n'y a pas pour nous de problème plus capital ni plus brûlant que de maintenir notre indépendance. And to maintain France's independent stand, de Gaulle wanted the support of like-minded Asian leaders. His man to test the Asian waters was, of course, André Malraux, the government's Asia expert, who gladly agreed to the mission. He was finally going to visit India, his first trip there since his expedition to Gantara, and he looked forward to renewing his acquaintance with Prime Minister Nehru after an absence of over 20 years. When Malro first met Nehru in 1936, he had just returned from combat in the Spanish Civil War. His literary talents had combined with his dramatic air campaigns to make him France's most sought-after writer. Nehru, on the other hand, was known in France only to a handful of people as Gandhi's devoted disciple against the British colonial regime. What struck the Indian novelist Raja Rao, who had introduced Malro to Nehru, was that the meeting took place at all. At that time, Pandit was an unknown, and especially in France, hardly known. In fact, when he came to Paris at the, at the airport or railway station, I don't remember, I found that he was, <coughs> there were probably five or ten people at the door. Because he was not an important man as yet, and and he was also India was not so important. But when Malro reached New Delhi in November of 1958, the roles had been reversed. Nehru was now the head of a government in whose hands lay the destiny of over half a billion people. The two men, now finding themselves in seats of power, reminisced about those difficult times, about their respective trysts with destiny that had put them at the mercy of jailers and which had now brought them back together. Nehru, for Malraux, was a statesman, something which Malraux never was. He was also uh, an intellectual in 
Malraux's eyes. Malraux used Nehru in his anti-memoirs uh, to give substance to a wound he had in Spain, or that he is supposed to have had in Spain. But the fact is that Malraux was a formidable actor, and he was also the director. And among the characters he wanted on his personal private stage was Nehru. And, you know, not a bad choice. At a more informal dinner, the evening following his arrival, Nehru suggested to Malraux that he visit the temple cities of South India, a land so vastly different, ethnically and culturally, from the Gandhara region he had seen 30 years earlier, but where Hinduism had been continuously flourishing for 3,000 years. By coincidence, Raja Rao, himself from the south, was also in India at that time, and gladly agreed to accompany his old friend and minister on this unexpected journey. It was here by the southern shores of India, at the stone temples of Mahabalipuram, that Malro's Hindu pilgrimage began. Over 1,500 years ago, the Pallava kings of the peninsula had chiseled in granite, under the vault of the burning sky, this fabulous open-air museum of sculpture. Why was it built? What purpose did it serve? And why did its royal patronage suddenly disappear in the 8th century? This was one of history's enigmas that Malro took to heart, and he marvelled at how this silent world continued to offer communion to the pilgrim without ever unveiling its original destiny. And then, suddenly, Malro came across a series of elephants hewn out of living rock, and his memories of Buddhist teachings rushed back. The elephant is the wisest of all animals. He is the only one who remembers his former lives. Nehru was right. For more than a millennia, Hinduism here had indeed flourished, preaching not the redemption of the impure soul, but the inevitable turn of the cosmic wheel of existence, whose supreme call is that of meditation. Nowhere was this more evident than in Arjuna's penance, perhaps the world's largest bas-relief that throbs with the vastness of conception, and where the inner beauty of the world's creatures is borne out in the humility of their penance and in their awe of the divine. Malro realized that everywhere here was a pious rapture contemplating the condition of man and all living beings, whose cycle of death and rebirth was their destiny, but not their fate. I'll tell you one thing very remarkable about Malro. Malro absorbed everything. There's nothing he rejected. And he understood. He opened himself so much that he could really feel these things almost as if they were, he were a Hindu or, or something. He was, he was not just observant of a foreign country. It was his own picture and whole country. And that is, I think, a very important thing. But if Mahabalipuram remained a historical enigma of unadorned granite, in the even older temple city of Madurai, Maru found a lively centre of worship, coloured as much by the thousands of icons emerging from its walls as by the innumerable Brahmins performing rituals of devotion and service to the gods. And suddenly, out of nowhere, a young couple rushed towards the minister and pleaded with him to preside over their marriage ceremony. In this sanctuary, where temples rose out to the sky, for just a passing moment, Maru discovered his latest incarnation as a priest. Malraux, dans ce geste de préparer la teinture de bonheur, enfin, qui allait s'imprimer sur le, le front de ces jeunes gens, il était comme en communion, si vous voulez. Et par ailleurs, Malraux, qui avait un œil d'aigle pour capter toutes sortes de vues autour de lui, a aperçu la photo de la déesse de la mort et il se penchait, il penchait sa tête vers cette statue aussi. Et je suppose que dans son esprit, Il pensait à la vie et à la mort en même temps. Enfin, je ne peux pas être dans la pensée de Malraux, naturellement, surtout après tellement d'années. Mais j'ai imaginé à ce moment-là, j'ai imaginé à ce moment-là que il suivait cette trajectoire du bonheur des jeunes et, et du futur qui serait le néant, n'est-ce pas, la mort, en regardant Kali. The temple of Madurai is much bigger than a cathedral. Its towers of a dazzling blue against the blue sky dominate the town, looming up at every turning in the narrow streets. 
Its immensity is present like that of the sea in the streets of ports. It is as though peasant piety had raised these towers of Babel covered with a vegetation of gods as it raised the towers of Shaf. In Madurai, I realized that our cathedrals are peopled by motionless Christians. Here, I was making my way through the endless aisles of a cathedral without a nerve, whose nine towers loomed up unexpectedly, riddled with swallows beneath the eagle's solemn flight. This architecture, so rigorously controlled, its plans determined by geomancers, appeared as an epic chaos. On its stones, in its cavernous aisles, the statues had no more significance than the walkers. Springy monkeys accompanied us one moment, left us the next. A black cat came down and walked away as if he were the secret of the universe. No temple mingles around human and divine figures so strikingly in its motionless dance. It is the dance of the universe, and the soul of the temple is the dance of Shiva. In 1961, the spectre of death that had been overshadowing Malro ever since his childhood rose as never before. His two sons, Vincent and Gauthier, aged only 18 and 20, died in a highway car accident. Despite his many musings on death, nothing had prepared him for this unexpected and brutal loss. The loss was compounded 18 months later by the separation from his wife Madeleine who had been by his side for several years. Agitated, despondent, and even suicidal, according to some, Malraux longed for a break from his ministerial routine in Paris to give himself time to make sense of all that had been afflicting him. L'état intérieur d'un être est toujours de l'ordre de son propre secret, mais nous avons des signes. En 1965, Malraux avait beau être ministre d'État, c'est un titre important du général de Gaulle qu'il aimait beaucoup, il allait mal. Il avait perdu ses deux fils quelques années auparavant, il était en train de se séparer de sa femme, Madeleine, et la créativité l'avait quitté. Il n'avait plus écrit depuis les grands livres sur l'art qu'il avait publiés dans les années qui ont précédé le retour du général de Gaulle au pouvoir. Et un jour, dans son bureau, rue de Valois, le bureau du ministère de la Culture, il tend le livre de Drieux La Rochelle, l'écrivain français, il le tend à un de ses principaux collaborateurs, qui se trouve être le mari de Geneviève de Gaulle, donc de la famille du général de Gaulle, sans un mot. Et ensuite, ce collaborateur sait qu'il a envie de partir en Asie. Ce collaborateur qui connaît parfaitement bien Malraux comprend qu'il y a l'idée d'aller mourir en Asie. Voilà un des signes principaux que nous pouvons avoir qu'il y avait cette idée de suicide. Le suicide ne l'a jamais quitté. Il ne faut jamais oublier que son grand-père s'est suicidé, son père lui-même s'est suicidé, et que pendant la guerre, pendant les actes de résistance, Malraux est allé au-devant de la mort, à la fois par un acte d'héroïsme, mais en même temps pour narguer la mort. Le tête-à-tête, le entre Malraux et la mort est quelque chose d'essentiel. Il l'a regardé, il l'a nargué, il l'a courtisé comme une femme. Il avait envie à la fois de la, de la rencontrer, de se séparer d'elle. Et là, en 65, on est sûrement arrivé à un moment de paroxysme dans cette relation avec la mort. By coincidence, the University of Benares had decided that very year to confer upon Malraux an honorary doctorate and Malraux sensed that this was the opportunity he had been seeking. The invitation seemed to be more than just a coincidence. 
Benares was a city that almost seemed to know death from the inside. For thousands of years, Hindus from across the subcontinent had been coming to this city to pay their final respects to the dead and to immerse their ashes in the Ganges, a river as old as the cycle of reincarnation itself. If there was any place in the world, it was undoubtedly Benares that could help Nauro come to terms with the loss of his sons and with the realization that he would have to live with their memory for many years to come. Of the ephemeral nature of life, and the futility of sorrow, he had heard much. Yet it was in this ancient city by India's holiest river, while staring into the very funeral pyres that reminded him of his lost sons, that Mauro saw with his own eyes, death being given homage as the highest form of detachment. Je crois qu'il était très profondément imprégné des grands textes sacrés de l'Inde, les Upanishads, le Veda, il a beaucoup lu les vies du Bouddha, donc vraiment ça faisait intimement partie dans son univers intérieur. Donc ça n'est pas du tout par hasard qu'en 1965, alors qu'il y a ce double phénomène, d'un côté cet appel de la mort qu'il a surmonté, et d'un autre côté, sur le bateau qui l'entraîne vers l'Asie, il retrouve la créativité, et c'est là où il écrit les premières pages des Antimémoires, c'est-à-dire le début, de ce qui est peut-être son chef-d'œuvre, qui deviendra plus tard le miroir des limbes. Deux phénomènes en lui, il a vaincu la mort et la créativité revient. Mais il va à Bénarès à nouveau interroger les bûchers. Pas seulement les bûchers, il va aussi interroger les grands temples, les grands sanctuaires. Et il y va aussi pour Shiva. Et c'est un des rares Français à avoir bien compris que l'élan de création et l'élan de destruction sont intimement liés alors que dans notre pensée, nous les séparons comme s'ils étaient opposés. La culture indienne arrive à les associer dans la personne de Shiva. Et il est évident que Malraux a eu à ce moment-là, à Benares, un dialogue intime et profond avec le mythe de Shiva. Je ne dis pas qu'il y croyait. Il n'y allait pas comme un hindou. Il s'est toujours situé comme un agnostique. Mais il est allé interroger le mythe. Et pour lui, c'était fondamental. À ce moment, Benares était le Ganges. A sparrow hawk followed our boat among the fires of the funeral pyres, constantly replenished, and the piles of wood for the cremations. Amid the swirling of the river, hemp-colored like the city, a silent voice within me was quoting, here are the sacred waters of the Ganges, which sanctify the gaping mouths of the dead. The great prayer of India, which the West must have known at the time when the first peals of bells awoke the faithful in the Merovingian dawn, rose from this multitude, which for so many years had been greeting the same river and the same sun with the same hymns, and with the same cremations, casually incinerating what the West calls life. No doubt every civilization is haunted, visibly or invisibly, by what it thinks about death. The truth of death, domain of the unverifiable, can only be the subject of a revelation. But this revelation is the relationship between India and the world. In March 1971, following the victory of Mujibur Rehman, the separatist leader of the opposition in East Pakistan, Pakistani forces intervened to stem the growing agitation and to preempt any declaration of independence. The ensuing violence was unprecedented. 
Within the first week alone, 30,000 people were killed in Dhaka, the regional capital. And that was just the beginning of the Pakistani army's butchery. By the middle of August, the number of dead could be counted in the hundreds of thousands. And for neighbouring India, the problem reached an alarming scale as millions of East Bengalis crossed over to escape the violence. Indra Gandhi, Jawaharlal Nehru's daughter, who had become Prime Minister of India just a few years earlier, tried to draw the world's attention to the plight of the refugees and for the urgent need to resolve the growing crisis. And one of the first persons she turned to was her father's old friend, André Malraux. On a trip to Paris, she made it a point to meet Malraux and requested the Indian Embassy to keep him informed of all the latest developments. Well, when um, Mr. Malraux met Mrs. Gandhi at uh, the ambassador's residence, it was decided that uh, I would go periodically to Beriel Puisson, where he was residing, and brief him on the developments in uh, the struggle for liberation of Bangladesh. And why I got involved was because uh, I was uh, called in to interpret uh, for Mrs. Gandhi and to uh, take notes. And that's how it began. And I visited Very Le Buisson half a dozen times or more, uh, basically with the idea of keeping him informed and uh, hearing what he had to say and communicating uh, all that he said to me uh, in, a, in a form of a note uh, to the ambassador for onward transmission uh, to the prime minister's office. From his home at verrier le buisson Malraux, seen here with photographs of victims of the Pakistani army's atrocities, became increasingly vocal in his support of Bangladeshi independence. Public opinion uh, is important in democracies in uh, putting pressure on governments. And I think where he did certainly help was that the fact that he, uh, with his background and with his uh, political importance, um, was involved in this, uh, encouraged many journalists and many commentators, and some serious ones, uh, to go to Bangladesh and see for themselves what was happening and report on, on events. And uh, since I was also at that time, the uh, press attaché, or second secretary press, um, I was in touch with these journalists who asked for visas and went there. So to that extent, yes, he did help indirectly in uh, shaping public opinion and commentaries in the French press favorable to the liberation uh, struggle in Bangladesh. But Malraux felt dissatisfied with his de facto role as spokesperson for the Bangladeshi cause. On the 17th of September, 1971, he announced to his companion, Sophie de Villemorin, that he had just had a long talk with Indira Gandhi over the phone, which had ended on a rather dramatic note. Un soir, et j'étais très étonnée lorsqu'il m'a dit, je suis extrêmement ennuyée par ce que Madame Indira Gandhi m'a convié à une table ronde qu'elle souhaite réunir euh, pour euh, confronter les avis de personnalité mondiale pour essayer de régler le grave problème du, du Pakistan puisque le Pakistan oriental se rebelle contre le Pakistan occidental. Or, je ne crois pas que les paroles puissent résoudre une situation semblable et j'ai répondu que seule l'action pouvait venir à bout de ce problème et non pas les paroles et que donc je ne pensais pas utile de me rendre à cette table ronde. Alors c'est ce que j'ai voulu dire mais j'ai dû m'exprimer de façon ambiguë parce que j'ai vu dans les journaux aujourd'hui qu'il qu était annoncé que j'allais me battre en faveur du Bangladesh et je ne sais pas du tout comment résoudre ce problème. Indeed, newspapers across the country and around the world carried headlines of Malraux's astonishing declaration. But even as the misunderstanding became a fait accompli, Malraux began to increasingly fancy himself as a commander in the East Bengal theatre. So as soon as the first statements of Malraux came in favour of the independence of Bangladesh, naturally as the only Indian correspondent in Paris, for me that was the story that I needed to chase. And as good luck would have it, the Indian writer Mulkraj Anand 
uh, called me up and he said that uh, he had been asked by Indira Gandhi to go and meet uh, Henri Malraux, but since he didn't know French, would I serve as his interpreter? And of course, I jumped on the occasion, a chance to, to meet Malraux and really to find out how he intended to specifically, concretely support this movement for the independence of Bangladesh. So we uh, drove uh, Mulkaj Anand and myself with the former girlfriend of, uh, of Mulks. She's the one who drove us all the way to Verrières le Buisson, which is in the suburbs of, of Paris. And I remember we came there around uh, four o'clock in the afternoon. Malro first took us to the Blue Room. The Blue Room is where he habitually received visitors. And Mulk and he, first of all, exchanged souvenirs, memories about the Spanish Civil War, because uh, Malro, as you doubtless know, was involved in the Spanish Civil War on the side of the Republicans. And so was uh, Mulk Rajan, who was then in, in London. They hadn't met each other then, but they exchanged memories. And after a while, Malro suddenly gets up and says, uh, come along, follow me. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do specifically for the freedom struggle in Bangladesh. And uh, we enter, therefore, a billiards room. And on this billiards room, you have an extraordinary spectacle of the map of the then East Pakistan, and then toy planes and toy soldiers, the ones that are made of lead, all over the place. And then in the manner of a military commander, he, for the next 20 minutes, said how he was going to use the Air Force, those planes, uh, how he's going to send the armored tanks, and ultimately how they're going to, to capture Chittagong on the one side and eventually surround Hakka, etc., etc. However, Malro's plans for action became redundant when, on the 3rd of December, 1971, Indira Gandhi finally took the decision to send in the Indian army to assist the Bangladeshi rebels and to stop further Pakistani massacres of civilians. Malro's departure for war was indefinitely postponed. Il y a eu un jour la nouvelle qu'Indira Gandhi mettait ses chars en route pour défendre le Bangladesh et André Malraux a très bien accueilli cette nouvelle parce qu'elle correspondait tout à fait à sa position initiale qui était c'est une action, il voulait dire une action de l'Inde qui va sauver le Bangladesh. Et euh, cela résolvait un problème difficile à résoudre pour lui et qui était de loin le mieux pour rétablir la situation et assurer la liberté du Bangladesh. A few days after India sent in her troops, Mauro published his famous open letter to President Nixon, criticizing the United States alliance with Pakistan. For many Bangladeshis who viewed Nixon with as much hatred as Pakistan itself, the act made Malro an instant hero. That letter did not have an impact on the course of events leading to the independence of Bangladesh, but it had an impact only in the sense that it showed that at a time when the rest of the intelligentsia in France, many other parts of Europe, was uh, not willing to, to, to support a true movement of liberation, one voice stood out loud and clear, and that was the voice of Andre Malo. In the meantime, India's military intervention was proving decisive. Within a few weeks, the war had come to an end. Pakistan had surrendered, and an independent Bangladesh came into existence. Two years later, in 1973, Indra Gandhi welcomed Malro at her residence in New Delhi. He had proved a valuable ally, at a time when the West had done little to address the political or humanitarian crisis of Bangladesh. And more than just a visiting dignitary, the Prime Minister treated Malro as a comrade in their common struggle for Bangladesh's freedom. Following their meeting, Malro decided to visit war veterans and, in his own words, to observe the extent to which political follies can perpetrate avoidable tragedies on human beings. Uh. La dernière fois que j'étais dans les hôpitaux, c'était pour mes propres blessés. Il sait que j'ai été aussi un chef de maquis et je les regarde avec le commun de l'espèce. Je regarde bien. Je me suis dit que je suis allé à l'hôpital, je suis allé à l'hôpital, je suis allé à l'hôpital. Et au moment de la fiction. Et au moment de la fiction, je suis allé à l'hôpital. Et au moment de la fiction, je suis allé à l'hôpital. Malraux 
partly use the uh, Bangladesh episode to solidify his image as the intellectual who is committed, who is there to liberate the peoples of the earth. But he also used that episode to ingratiate himself with President Nixon. You mustn't forget that he wrote an open letter to President Nixon saying uh, that American policy uh, supporting uh, Pakistan was uh, all wrong. And thereupon, President Nixon invited him to Washington so as Malraux could give him the benefit of his deep knowledge of Mao Zedong, which was exactly equivalent to nil. And there again, he took in Nixon. I don't think he ever took in Nehru, but he did take in Nixon, pretending that he knew Mao Zedong very, very well. But there, the documents and the witnesses have caught up with him. The strangest and the oddest thing about Malraux, when one writes his biography, is the following question. How could somebody so gifted, so intelligent, not realize that one day history, documents, archives, witnesses would catch up with him. Despite his critics, Malraux's role as a liberator was at last cemented. He had been dreaming of such a reception since his days in Indochina and Spain, but it was only now, in his old age, that it had finally come true. In November 1974, Malraux returned to India in what was to be his fifth and final trip to the country. Invited to New Delhi to receive the Jawaharlal Nehru Prize for International Understanding, he nevertheless quickly moved down to Bombay, the port city he had first discovered with Raja Rao in 1958. When Malraux came to India, he had just recovered from an illness that had proved almost fatal. Indeed, throughout the trip, perhaps overwhelmed by his own sense of mortality, he would grapple with how Indian art comes to terms with the end of this life and offers spiritual guidance to those accepting the finality of their own existence. After what Malraux said, he came to Bombay because he came to suffer a huge crisis in the hospital, in the Salle Petrière, where he was going to die, where he was going to die. And in this crisis, he was going to die. And in this crisis, he was going to die qui a précédé cette crise, il se voyait à, à Bombay. Il entendait l'océan Indien à Bombay. C'était en quelque sorte son cœur, qui, les battements de son cœur étaient les battements de la mer. Et il se sentait près de l'île d'Elephanta. Et il a eu une envie extraordinaire de revoir cette statue qui était pour lui, puisque l'art pour lui était le langage permettait d'aborder un peu l'au-delà. C'était lui, c'était le, le seul langage qui pouvait lui apporter quelque chose au moment de sa mort. C'était Bombay, particulièrement Elephanta, et particulièrement Elephanta de Trimurti. Not surprisingly, then, Malraux's first request was to visit Elephanta, an island only a few kilometers into the sea, but a world away from modern Bombay, where, a thousand years earlier, a Brahmin temple had been cut out of rock and sanctified in the name of Shiva, the Lord of Destruction. Everywhere in this sanctuary, through the chambers, past the columns, and into the corridors, a balance is consciously maintained between areas of untreated stone and highly polished surfaces, as if to accentuate the eternal march of the cycle of life, and of the inevitable return to nature, which is in itself an aesthetic experience. But above all, what held Malraux spellbound was the gigantic Trimurti, the triple-headed Shiva, with its eyes shut to all men, towering above them and welcoming them to their fate. So powerful was it that for a while, Malro almost seemed to prefer the safety of his corner to the unbridled radiance of this treasure in stone. As soon as one entered Elephanta, the glittering ocean was borne away, like the towns, like the India of the British Raj, the India of the Mughals, the India of Nehru all perishable offerings to the famous majesty, the gigantic triple head of Shiva. Here, recognizable at first glance, is a masterpiece of sculpture, a full face with two monumental profiles that are worthy of the very highest works of art. And this statue, which represents 
sur le même personnage, trois têtes, deux de profil et une de face, était un peu le symbole de, de notre passage sur Terre, en sens qu'il y avait un profil où l'homme est assailli par tous ses démons, très grimaçante, une autre très sensuelle, assaillie par toutes les joies de la vie, et au milieu, la, la paix de toutes, ces, de toutes ces fureurs, de toutes ces passions. Et cette paix, c'était pour lui euh, presque une réponse à, ce, à cette angoisse de ne pas savoir ce qu'il y a derrière la mort, euh, et auquel il ne voulait pas répondre parce qu'il ne voulait pas inventer, il voulait le ressentir. Il ne le ressentait nulle part, mais peut-être un peu là, à l'éléphantin. But Malraux's final pilgrimage had only begun. He now turned his attention to the sacred caves of Ajanta, 300 kilometers to the east of Bombay. Here, in 1819, after over a thousand years of obscurity, these Buddhist monastic retreats had been rediscovered and with them, sculptures and mural paintings of unparalleled beauty. But why had Malro come here? Was it to understand, after all these years, the spiritual guidance his father had sought just before killing himself? Or was it, now in his old age, to solicit a distant message of calm and detachment, as death neared, and shone as rays from behind the throne of life? Whatever the answer, one thing was certain, Malro found rich signs of the only religion he had ever claimed as his own, art. These frescoes of such fresh colors, as large as our tapestries, express softness and passivity. It is moving to find such refinement in such a lost area, where it is hard to imagine that advanced civilization actually flourished. Here reigns Buddhist compassion, that is to say, the contrary of the tragic. It is a simple happiness, that borrows the language of trees and animals, a language the West never knew, except with St. Francis. Malro's journey through what he called India's sacred caves took him next to Ellora, just a few kilometers away. And it was here, in this extraordinary flowering of rock temples, literally dug out of the mountains, more fantastic and extensive than anything he had ever come across, that Malro felt that he was finally face to face with eternal India. As opposed to our cathedrals that rise to the sky, reaching ever closer to divinity, this abyss where we found ourselves gives the impression of being at the center of the earth itself. The fact that no stones were brought here and that one had to dig straight out of the rocks reinforces the sensation of being at one with nature, that is to say, with the divine. Temples, statues, bas-reliefs were all part of the mountain as a divine efflorescence. Never before had I felt so strongly how sacred art invites worshippers to participate in the secret of the world without ever revealing it. I was in the nocturnal garden of the great dreams of India. Oui, cette intériorité lui plaisait beaucoup, car ces angoisses, ces questions que il se posait, que l'humanité s'est posée depuis toujours, sont des questions intérieures, ne sont pas des questions extérieures. Même si nous regardons le ciel, la question vient de notre intérieur. Donc, le fait que ça soit représenté d'une manière euh, dans une grotte d'une manière ou dans un, une cavité une, comme sortant de la terre ou, ou enfermé dans une grotte, lui paraissait plus correspondre à notre angoisse et mieux donc y répondre. Et la réponse lui, lui était plus proche, lui était plus, plus personnelle. When Mauro left India for the last time, on the 20th of November, 1974, the sun had well begun setting on his own life. 
over a 50 year span, he had come here as an adventurer, a minister, a mourner, and as a pilgrim. Haunted each time by the grandness of its leaders, the beauty of its arts, and the wealth of its cultural heritage. On the way, he had, in his own measure, helped this country assume its full place among the family of free nations. Yet, he remained uncharacteristically humble of what he had learnt here, and would no doubt take with him till his very last days. Of this civilization, what did I really know? Its arts, its thinking, its history? As with large bygone civilizations, I had heard its music and met a few of its gurus, but I had no presumptions of knowing a thought that had resisted 17 conquests and 2,000 years. I had merely tried to grasp some of its aspects that had obsessed me.